Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's uh, begin with prayer. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you give us and all that you do for us this time of year as we consider the, the birth of Jesus and the, the results of his life for us, his life and death and his resurrection. Remind us of that every day, and particularly this season. Let us never forget that Jesus didn't remain a baby in a manger, but grew up to be a man on, dying on a cross to save us. But he didn't remain on the cross or in the grave. He came out of the grave, was resurrected. That provides us eternal life. Thank you for that. Give us a good time in, in the service now as we continue to study the resurrection and then in the service to follow that you might be honored and glorified. Thank you for loving us and for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're nearing the end. All of what we have been going through in the, and I've cut out a few of the uh, videos, all of that we've been going through in this uh, series has been building up to this end. What does it mean and why is it important and how do you use it? So in the next two lectures and then a, a closeout lecture, uh, he is talking about the theology of it, what it means, how, where we get it, uh, why, why it's important, and so forth. And uh, he has two of those lectures. And then, uh, well, I guess there's four le lectures left, one today and three more, um, on, how, on what all this means, why we went through all of this other groundwork, and how we build on it. So if there are no questions, um, remind me or tell me during the, during the video if you have a question, and I will uh, attempt to uh, stop it without blowing it up. No promises, but I'll try. This uh, lecture is uh, Grounding Theology, Part 1. up to, uh, to this point, and uh, let me fill you in real quickly. Uh, we had a long stretch toward the middle of the course on that. We moved to evidence. Under evidence, we discussed how the power of appearances, the empty tomb, and the timeline. Then we moved to the between the and apology, those are three topics. The idea, your underlying idea, is that whatever Jesus is true, that in the first lecture and the That if, if uh, Jesus, if Jesus are true, we need to resurrect. He did that by the meaning of the word. His definition, Jews and Jews, it's used specifically by Jesus. His teachings is being true. And lastly, that's how he's understood in the early church. I'm going to return to that topic here in just a few minutes. You here. We said about himself. Just before this last that would be more bombastic than the two main 
teens I spoke about. Namely, what did he think he was? And the teaching of the kingdom. And the uh, one who proclaimed the message, he is the message. So in a way, he determines where you spend eternity. To me, are the most fantastic teachings of Jesus. That he was dead, and that he's the path to God. Not just that he had the words to the path, but the teaching, but that he was the path itself. All right, so unpack those two. In the last lecture, we talked about um, who Jesus was. That move now from Jesus. Who did he think he was? And the general principle is like this: here we are of the resurrection of. And then, and whatever particular talk about, the more sure we are that what he thought was true. And I'd like to ask this in the last two lectures, so the stream works a little. One example of, namely, eternal life. The general area of practice and about total commitment to Christ. The principle is going to be something like this. The resurrection is God's temple of Jesus. We've introduced this already, but I'm going to spend some time on that. The principle is that God approves. Jesus taught. I think we've earned the right to say that because we worked up to that point. And, and the basic of the logic is heard, we have a bridge between resurrection and teaching or miracle and teachings. So if you didn't know of something true, and you and you hopefully will see this real clearly in the next lecture on the actual This is to know the truth, know what you taught. Now, I'll use an example that I'm not going to be back. I'll use this as I didn't have time to work this in. So I'll use this as an example right now, so you see what I'm saying. People will ask, How what do we believe the Bible is the Word of God? And Christians go after this. With different sort of answers. Probably the primary evangelical way is to say the book is Many apologists say we should trust the Bible. Steps. It's a reliable book. Well, uh, that only says it's copied well. Then you have to know it's, it's copied as true. Archaeology, miracles of Jesus, any number of signs to show that scripture teaches. Is you compare the Bible to Josephus, the old, maybe you compare the Old Testament to Josephus, the New Testament to. Uh, Acidus or Suetonius, and you say the Bible um, You might cut off if you're careful. with that argument. I would example now because my overall lecture today is not confirmed. So let, let me re-ask that with inspiration. 
our way to get this right is not to say a book, this reliable book claim inspired. I think that's to say, what did Jesus teach about inspiration? And your argument is, Jesus accepted the inspiration of Scripture, and Jesus was raised from the dead. To me, that's the move I would make. Not if the reliable text, the reliable text claims inspired. If you thought it was inspired, Okay, so be my chief reason. Just ask what Jesus said about it. Because Jesus is great. That's right. And then of course you get some Jesus taught it, and they must have understood him correctly because the early church teaching. And they Uh, if we know what Jesus, we know it's true because of of saying Christianity or something like that. And sometimes people make the move, and I think there's some real value to this to say, well, I'm not teaching that. If the emphasis is on me, I'm not saying it because it's my teaching. I'm saying Jesus' teaching. This is raised from the dead, and I know it's a little bit of a if you got a problem, just take it up with Jesus. I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling you what you thought. He was raised from the dead. Give me a better reason I should cite Jesus. So this general move, this general kind of, he was he was raised from the dead. Therefore, what he taught was true. I think makes the most sense. If you think about the diagram we did a few lectures ago, two ways to connect to the resurrection. And so here's the way he argued. Or now, if the you know Jesus teaches the truth, the two paths would be a retrospective prospective. The two paths would be Jesus think God Jesus would have to be tied to the resurrection because this event requires these attributes. The state can't raise the dead, human can't raise the dead. himself. So God, for these reasons, and ID. God exists. That should happen. This event requires these attributes. Therefore, when I ask the question, why would this cause this event? The only thing I can think by raising from the dead, he's blessing the or he's confirming the mystery of Jesus, or his message to be true. That's the way uh, I would do it. Over to the record, start with the resurrection. happened. Therefore, the God who raised, the one who raised Jesus, the God of the universe. From this argument, resurrection to be step one, God would would be the same. Therefore, what Jesus said. Uh, said that in the next lecture, the Lord will you both these ways to do it. And talking about eternal life, talking about the God. But for now, that's all. This time, let me share uh, on a biblical approach. Did the earth argue the same way? And I'm gonna I'm gonna make the New Testament argues that raising God for his message. That's where I'm going to the second half of this lecture. By raising Jesus from the dead, God is a his message. Where does it say that in Scripture? Well, first of all, I have to say something I just said a few lectures ago. Just some made that move. If this happens, then I am who I said I was. I mean, consider Mark 2. Forgiven. You can't say that. Blasphemy. Well, 
So you know I can I'm gonna kill the soul. This is what it says. My miracle shows that it is true. For example, sometimes when um the Jewish leaders Messiah, Matthew twelve, Matthew both times he says, A wicked generation seeks a sign. I will still give you the sign of the prophet Jonah. The sign of the prophet Jonah, the resurrection, which show who he claimed to be. And the other example I use from the teaching of Jesus, John the Baptist, the same things you see and of his miracles. So the first point I want to make is Jesus himself. Jesus himself argued that resurrection in particular are the sign that this teaches It certainly does. I think earlier, let's read it. As the book of Acts dawns, and the claim of Acts is just the way the church is born, this starts on Pentecost. Peter stands up and gives Christian sermon, first, first post-Christ sermon. This is in, in Acts 2. He says, Jesus approved among you. Jesus Jesus teaches your true. Jesus is and approved among you. And Acts 2, 22, 23, 24. Or Peter says, he was the dead. He was among us. He died, but then God raised him. That shows that, boom, stamp of approval. Approved. That's what resurrection says. That was preaching at and uh, at the at the uh, conclave of philosophers, talks about the unknown God. philosophers, and he says, "Is the man Jesus repent? He's by him, and he's proven this." Is the King James? He's proven this. Not the translations say. Things like, he's shown this to be true by raising it from the dead. So for the second time in Acts, 1 Peter, 2 Paul, the resurrection is the chief sign that Jesus' teachings are true. Okay, a couple times where we see this in Paul, what we've mentioned, and then Romans chapter 1, three Pauline creed. Uh, if you're interested, the footnote would say our agrees. That's it's pretty That's a pretty creed. Jesus showed himself three titles. Jesus showed himself in my order. I'm doing it. I'll go lesser son of God Messiah or Christ raised the dead Jesus says these things by virtue of the resurrection I said earlier does that mean some people say barter of adoption is creed. it's a protonastic agnostic world we said God adopted him as resurrection to be the text doesn't say that. The text doesn't say God it says he always does the world by raising Jesus stamp, stamp, approved, Acts two, approved. Acts 17, 
approved. Romans chapter one. The key place in scripture theology follows from the resurrection. Theology follows the resurrection. Uh, I think we'd have to go to First Corinthians chapter fifteen. And remember the context. When I came determines whether or not you're saved, which is another way of saying it. Then Paul Paul and Creed, verses three and follow. Here's the three individual uh, two individuals three. Whether verse them, so we appreciate it. And then he starts saying, because of that, follows from the truth. Beginning in verse 12, he says that because it's true, first couple of things he says, we're not and we're not. And who's the we're? The we're there is the other. In verse 11, the ones he says, them, we're preaching the same. We're preaching the same thing. Our preaching is not to be if you weren't raised. In verse 14, so two times this passage where, where Paul says, Jesus has been raised, your faith is vain. At this time is verse 17, and I'll make this informational footnote on. I won't have to make it when we get to verse 17. But the two times Paul says your faith is vain, it's a different Greek word each time. Vain, vain, translated vain, verse 17. But the Greek word in both places means ungrounded. That's interesting, because if it's ungrounded, if Jesus hasn't been raised, Grounded, but he has been raised. Raised, our faith is grounded. Because Christ has been raised, our preaching is not vain. Witnessing is not vain. Faith is not vain. That's twelve. Verse seventeen. Verse eighteen. Verse nineteen. The really key things it says in verse seventeen. He says, again, your faith is vain. He says, you're still in your sins. Pretty rough. If Christ has not been raised, you're still in your sins. But see, if Christ has been raised, now you're free from your sins. So once again, the implication is you don't have the confirmation with the resurrection. For me, it may be for a lot of other people, but it really is for me. You know, you know my testimony, you, you know, by 18 would be touched. But verse 18 says, if Christ has not been raised, those who died, Christ have died in vain. You know, go if you want. Maybe you'll flee to the heavens. I don't know, but it's not going to be a Christian. Place. Jesus Christ. We have a Christian hope. I think of Paul in First Thessalonians, where he says, "We without hope." You know, there's a world of difference between grieving with and grieving without hope. Verse 18 says, "I have night and day." Small scripture. We are of all men most miserable. We have all been most miserable. Just about 10 more verses. If the dead are not raised, it depends on the resurrection of Jesus. So you could say, if Jesus is not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. A lot of people think it's a slogan, or it's a beer commercial, or it's, if you only go around once in a life, you think it's a. But Paul is citing the old time. That's how old that is. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow. The is in a bomb. 
talking about uh, practical things that are because of the resurrection. Verse 32, he says, if Christ has not been raised, let us Paul seems to be saying that if there's a resurrection, and if there's no resurrection, let us eat and drink. There's nothing else to live for. Is there something to live for? Oh, we have to live for? Or I mean, all the things that have been raised starts a new paragraph in verse 20. But in verse 19, we'd be of all, all uh, most. But in verse 19, it says, the first fruits of them that sleep. That so it takes us right to our next lecture. That's what So, resurrection grounds theology, and probably the key, the key is not in Corinthians 15 verses 12 through 19, and then that triumph that verse 20, we will be raised. I, it just occurs to me one other scripture, I mean it's a, a bunch, but one other neat place that will lead us right to the next lecture. Because Jesus has been raised, his security our life. This is a very piece of theology I'd like to discuss in here. The price has been raised to the next line of it to our resurrection. So that's that's the next one. We have a practical one on total commitment, and then we have a and uh, that makes it more pretty for the course. Okay, any questions from that? It was actually a Gallup study that uh, said that uh, people that go to church, and they did not define that, but go to church at least once a week, um, did not report self-report a decline in mental health. Every other segment of society has declined, has self-reported a decline in mental health um, since uh, since March. Only the people that go to church at least once a week did not. I'm not sure what that says. It says, hey, is my mic on? Okay, I can't, I can't hear myself. Um, I'm not sure what that says um, about the mental health of America. I know what it says about the mental health of of followers of Jesus. By and large, followers of Jesus are the ones that go to church once a week. But without that being defined, we have to take we have to be a little careful how we apply that. If they had defined church, is is that only evangelical church or is that any religious gathering? In other words, do Muslims and Jews fall into that and they use church in the in the religious sense, not in the uh, theological sense, I don't know. But it, it was an interesting st statistic that a non-Christian group put out. It wasn't by Barna, it was by Gallup. And so they're, and they're certainly not Christian. I think I might even talk about that a little bit in the message today, I don't know. Okay. Um, if you have your Bible, hey, Kate, can you give me a little more light? Thanks. My my glasses still, I do not have my new glasses yet, so I'm still having to adjust, and low light makes it even harder. Um, turn in your Bibles to, uh, to 1 Corinthians 15, and then we'll jump over to 1 Peter. Um, I want to go through that section that he was talking about. 
And, and he, he began that section by saying that theology follows from the resurrection. And, and, and that's, a, that's a philosophical logic statement. Um, that the theology that we can build necessitates the resurrection. As, as Paul wrote in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ isn't raised, then, then we're to be pitied. Um, and that's the truth, because we've all been misled. We all, we all bought into a bunch of bunk if Jesus hasn't been raised. And, and that statement makes the resurrection a central topic, a central pivot point to our theological understanding. So when you, when you look at uh, Revel uh, Revelation, at 1 Corinthians 15, he begins, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul, right from the beginning, is saying, listen, the gospel includes the resurrection, because that's the topic of what's following. It includes the resurrection. It is, it is central to it. For I delivered you to you as first importance. The most important thing is what he delivered to them, what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the th third day in accordance with the Scripture. That is the most important thing, he says. I delivered to you as of first importance. And he appeared to Cephas, uh, Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to the, all the apostles, least of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me, also to me. And uh, jump down to verse 12. Now it is, now, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If Jesus is raised, obviously resurrections can occur. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So we've got a, we've got a conundrum here. You can't say people don't raise from the dead if Jesus raised from the dead, and we have all these eyewitnesses that said he did. So what's the conclusion that Paul makes to the Corinthians that Jesus had been raised? If Christ has not been raised, verse 14, then our preaching is in, is in vain and your faith is in vain. What are we doing if Jesus hadn't been raised? I'm sorry? Dying, yeah, absolutely, dying. Seriously dead. I mean, like permanently dead. I mean, like no hope dead. You think that uh, perhaps the mental health of America has declined during this pandemic because for people other than people that go to church? Because they have no hope. And every day they watch the news and it looks like hope's even less. Of course. Frequently when we're watching the news, we will say, I don't know how the world survives without knowing Jesus. Without having some reason for hope. We are even found, uh, we are even, uh, found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. So if resurrection doesn't occur, then, then God's lying, or God doesn't exist and we're misrepresenting the truth. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ, or in Christ, we have hope in this life, only we are the most of the most people to be pitied. If Jesus isn't raised, then we are to be pitied. Now, the, the triumphal statement he was making. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have, been, who have fallen asleep. Whereas by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. By the way, that's an important passage, uh, an important verse to, uh, to argue against um, the, the modern thought 
that Adam and Eve were not real people and that sin originated with Adam. Because right there, Paul says, uh, For as by a man, a singular man, came death. Death entered into the universe when, when Adam sinned. And eternal life comes by another man, Jesus Christ. That's fundamental theological construct that you, you, uh, you're going to be like the rest of America if you don't believe in, uh, in the resurrection. Okay. Um, over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great... Uh, mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus isn't raised, neither are we. We have no hope for the future. Resurrection is... You ever wonder why in the Christian calendar... Early in the early church, why we know that when Easter happened, I mean, we have fairly we have fairly precise information about the resurrection, but we don't even know in what in which millennium Jesus was born in, right? Was he born before the turn of the century, or was he born after, or was he born at the turn of the century, which is why they made it the turn of the century? You can find ten scholars that will give you ten different answers. A couple of them will give you two answers. Because we just don't know. Why? Because his birth date, and we celebrate it big time, you know, at Christmas, it's not near as important as his death and resurrection date. To the early church, Christmas was not yet a thing, but Easter was the most important thing. And so that ought, to, that ought to tell us something. The resurrection of Jesus is central to our doctrine. You, you, can't, you, you can't have a Christian faith, a biblical Christian faith, without the resurrection. And then we have no hope if there's no resurrection. We've been uh, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading. That's what we have to look forward to. All of those aches and pains you took drugs for this morning, no more. That'll be cool. I'm seriously looking forward to that. I don't know if we'll have to sleep or if we will sleep, but I'm looking forward to a nice long nap. Boy, am I looking forward to a nice nap. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what the resurrection means. Questions, comments? Yeah, there was a, a family, I don't remember where it was, uh, their homeowners association, they had a nice Christmas cross. Which I think this is the, the, the coolest Christmas tree you could have. And their homeowners association made, made them take it down. It's okay to have Christmas trees and lights, but not a cross. Because what's a cross mean? There's a God. God sacrificed for us. And uh, we've got to live up to what he wants us to live up to. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to spend some time looking at the resurrection, for reminding us of the centrality of it to our faith. Give us a, a, a good service to follow that you might be honored and glorified and everything that we say and do would uh, reflect properly on you. Thank you for this season where we, can, where we can think of the birth of Jesus 
Remind us daily that it's not just about the birth. It's the birth that's, that led to death. It's not just about a death. It's death that led to a resurrection and what that resurrection provides for us. Thank you, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.